uh, in the area of quantum computing and AI. And I'd like to introduce my next guest to talk about this, Anna Paula Assis, the general manager for EMEA for IBM. Hi, Anna. John. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much for having Welcome me. Welcome to the sanctuary. Um, I'm excited for this chat uh, to talk about quantum computing. Okay. What is it? What is it? <laughs> Ooh. Well, let's just start with what is it for, yeah. right? And how we are approaching it. So I think it's very important to understand that quantum computing is not here to substitute the existing computing today, the class classical computers. Mm -hmm. And the approach that we are taking is a hybrid approach. So we see the future of computing a combination of three capabilities. Yeah. The bits that exist today in the classical computers, AI and the neurons, right? So the uh, neural uh, networks that you're going to implement to make the best out of AI technologies, and then the qubits of quantum. So when we think about quantum computing, where are we in terms of the development, right? So we approach this from three dimensions. First, the performance. Performance is absolutely critical, and I'm going to break down how you address performance. Yeah. Then value, which is your ability to do more with less. And finally, adoption, because you will need to create a new set of development capabilities, professionals, skilled resources to take advantage of this technology. Yeah. So let's start with performance. Performance is about the amount of qubits that you can put on a single chip. Mm -hmm. So at the end of last year, we announced a major milestone. We achieved 433 qubits yeah. in one single chip. If you, can, if you think about it, 2016, our co quantum computer had five qubits. Wow. Now 433 is a mm -hmm. significant growth. Um, then the second aspect is um, making sure that those qubits that are inside those chips, they behave properly according to quantum phys physics. And that's the topic of um, quality of the circuits that you have. And um, this is an area that is extremely complex because basically you get a pair of qubits and make sure that they sustain the operations. Uh, and then as you start to uh, compound that, it's almost like you are comparing on how a, a quantum computer performs against a classical computer in terms of the transistors that you can put on a single board. Right. Um, and then the third element is the speed of the circuits that you have in the quantum computer so that they can perform the operations faster. Yeah. So that's the topic of performance. Okay. The topic of value is really making sure that you change the way that you are uh, executing the operations in the circuits. Mm -hmm. And then the element of adoption. So basically, we develop um, a platform, an, uh, a language, a programming language called QSKIT, which is the basis for developing new code in quantum, and we have to make sure that we scale the knowledge in that, in that uh, platform. So mm. today we have 450,000 users logged in to learn about QSKIT. Okay. More than 2 million downloads of the code, and more than 200 partners in our network that are already testing and using real-world cases yeah. to simulate how quantum computing could solve some of the complex problems. Okay. So what are some of those complex problems then? What, what, give me your top two. Top two. Yeah. So let's go with financial services. Right. right. So financial services, there are lots of simulations that they need to do with how they allocate assets, how they make a, a recommendation of a best way to mm. invest for a certain client. Those are correlations that can be very complex. Yeah. It could take up to eight to 10 hours for a computer to do a Monte Carlo simulation. Mm -hmm. Hopefully with quantum computing, you're going to do, be, be able to do that in milliseconds, okay. right? Another aspect is on the science of materials. Right. So you were talking to David before, mm -hmm. right? Um, EV as, the, as one of the, the major technologies to uh, reduce carbon emission yeah. and how battery is going to be absolutely critical uh, to make sure that we really implement green, tech, green technologies and green mobility going forward. What's the best way to combine lithium and oxygen to optimize uh, batteries and make sure that they have a, a, full, a longer lifetime? Because this is one of the problems with batteries, right? I mean, the life cycle is short. You need to be replacing and changing for new uh, constantly. So how you extend life cycle of batteries mm -hmm. is another example. And, and just in terms of the practicalities of it all from a business, business perspective, um, are businesses going to be owning 
quantum computers, or is it going to be very much like the cloud, you it's, know, renting servers? The approach that we are taking is the cloud. So very much a, for, for IBM, a SaaS model. It's a SaaS model. Okay. Uh, we have physical uh, machines um, in the United States, yep. in Germany, in partnership with Fraunhofer Institute, yep. in Japan, in Tokyo. Um, but these are very specific implementations. The approach that we want to take is really to make the quantum centric, which is really a computer that is going to be accessible through the cloud to our clients. And in terms of uh, the, the tech advances that need to happen to really achieve uh, the goals you want to achieve, is it around chips mainly or other things? No, it's, a, it's around chips. Yeah. And it's around being a little bit technical, the compilers, which are really the, the code that allows the combination between classical computers and quantum to process right. uh, those algorithms. Okay, uh, let's talk about, it sounds great, <laughs> sounds very promising. Let's talk about some of the risks involved yes. in this venture though, because I've read a lot about cybersecurity being one of the key concerns with quantum computing, that quantum compu computing will, will render effectively modern encryption methods useless, that it would allow for more sophisticated cyber attacks. And when we start thinking about you know, nation state actors, geopolitics, etc., cetera, cybersecurity is, is a very key risk. So what's the way to, to deal with those, that specific risk? Yeah, so you have to create a totally different uh, encryption algorithm for quantum, right. right? It's not what you have today, it's a new, it's a new way to implement cybersecurity. Yeah. So since we started working with quantum, we knew that this was a problem. And we started working in developing algorithms uh, for encryption that would be quantum safe. Yeah. And we work with the NIST in the United States and four of the algorithms that they are recommending today for companies to implement to be quantum safe, um, three of them were uh, provided uh, with, uh, from IBM uh, research, yeah. right? So um, this can be done with, with this support. Many of the products that we sell today, uh, our hardware capabilities, they are already with these algorithms embedded right. so they can protect the data for the clients. So our recommendation today is that companies really start to prepare now uh, to these potential threats that are going to come because certainly this is one uh, of the use cases, unfortunately, that many uh, um, um, users are going to explore to take advantage of the technology. With the current power of your quantum computing, um, could you hack my WhatsApp currently? Um, or they, signal with there, the current equipment? There are hypotheses that at more than 400 qubits you could get there. Yeah. The problem is how fast you can actually do the calculations. Right. Yeah. So with the current setup, not yet. Okay. But it's coming at some time, so it's better to be prepared. Okay. Ooh, that's scary. <laughs> um, data collection, another yeah. concern. Mm -hmm. Companies already collecting huge amounts of data. And we've seen in Europe, obviously, to counter that GDPR, but it hasn't really sort of made a dent in a lot of these data collection practices as well. Um, again, with quantum, the amount of data that's going to be processing um, almost, to some extent, could incentivize companies to, to want to collect more data. Um, again, how, how do you think that concern could be countered? So I think we need to continue to ensure that regulatory uh, is implemented in the sense of Mm. making sure that privacy is in place, that the purpose for which you're, you're collecting that data is appropriate, yeah. uh, and that is going to be even more required that you, as you think about a post-quantum world. Yeah, and, and another thing I've been thinking about is um, geopolitics. Yeah. Because these days, technology, particularly emerging technology and high technology, has very been, caught, been much caught up in the, the geopolitical battle uh, between the US and China, Europe often caught in the middle of that as well. Quantum is certainly something China has put in its, its, its plans around technology. We know quantum could be a key technology going forward for so many things, as you explained. Is the, are you concerned about the way that this technology is, is most likely going to be caught up in, in this geopolitics game? So what China our approach has been really working with all the countries around the world that are um, setting up policies around uh, quantums. So today we have more than 21 countries in mm -hmm. the world that have already defined a very clear strategy around quantum. Yeah. Our focus is making sure that we have the right skills uh, in, in, around the world to use this technology. And we are being very intentional on how we want to approach that in terms of increasing this base or this, this pool of talent in a way that is inclusive, right? Yeah. Because we cannot make happen with this new wave of technology 
let happen with this new wave of technology what happened in the past, which mm -hmm. is leaving a lot of people behind. So we were working particularly with universities and schools that uh, are focused on the underrepresented uh, communities yeah. to make sure that they can really take advantage of this new wave of computing. So when you say you're being sort of very uh, you know, careful and very you know, deliberate about where you're going, what at the moment, what is the sort of scale of your quantum computing kind of research? Where are you? US, of course. Yes. But um, where else are you looking in terms no, of... No, we have, we have actually collaborations, for example, with Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, okay. right? So where they actually install the physical machine, mm -hmm. and it's one of the partners that collaborates with a network of companies in, in Germany yeah. um, to really... The, the important thing now is that companies start to think about what is this technology going to do for me? Mm. How this is going to transform my business model? What are the problems that I can you know, address with this technology that I cannot address <clears throat> with a classical computer today? Yeah. So we are really stimulating the creation of the use cases because that's the only way that the technology really is going to be applicable and of course allow us to continue to invest and scale. But our targets is that by 2025, we are in a position that the infrastructure um, is, and, and, and the software around it is, um, allows us to do something concrete with, uh, with quantum, so two to three years from now. Okay, and when do you think it, it becomes sort of mass, mass scale? Oh, that's a very difficult answer, because I think actually will depend on the problems that we, we will yeah. need to solve. And are you seeing, um, or how are you tackling the competitive landscape here? Because, of course, you know, you, IBM is involved in quantum, but there are a number of other technology companies also uh, some of the giants as well of yes. the world involved in this space. So as, as I explained in the beginning, we are, we are looking at it from a ver very verticalized approach mm -hmm. when it comes to the stack that we need to develop for the technology, yeah. but also from a horizontal approach in, in terms of the ecosystem mm -hmm. that we need to create to support the development of application solutions on top of the technology. So. I would say that today we are in a very advanced position. Right. Our commitment is to continue to do that. We have been hiring and recruiting the best researchers and uh, technology uh, developers out there yeah. to make sure that we continue to make progress. And just given uh, the macro environment currently, I know this is a long-term game for you, but just given the current macro environment with uh, you know, fears of a, a recession, uh, layoffs across the tech industry, etc. Has that scaled back any of the investments you're making in quantum computing? Or not any, at all. No? Not at all. Still we're, going. We're still going strong. Right. This is a key and focused area uh, for us. And quite frankly, what we see is technology adoption continue to grow. Um, Gartner is reporting a 5.1% growth in technology in the technology industry in 2023. Mm. Technology can really help companies go through this inflationary period to increase productivity. Yeah. So we continue to be very bullish. So you're not cutting jobs in quantum computing? No, not at all. You're hiring? hiring? Yes. If there is any uh, quantum experts here, just send us the resume. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know we've got about 30 seconds. So I just wanna, want you to give us a little crystal ball prediction. Um, you mentioned 2025, but beyond that, if you're looking sort of over a 10-year period, what is quantum computing at that point solving and doing? Oh, my God, we're probably going to um, hopefully find cures for many diseases that don't have cures today, um, medicine that is not available, so we, we can really solve very complex problems and certainly uh, deal with climate change and environmental issues. It's going to be a fascinating uh, watch over the coming years then, indeed. Anna Paula thank you so much for joining me. Thank you uh, for having me. A round of applause for our wonderful guest.